Good morning. I'm Pastor Truett from Quimby and Bethsaida United Methodist Churches. We're coming to you this morning from Quimby where the service is already underway. If you're watching by the YouTube or Facebook, we sure appreciate you, you tuning in. Today we will be considering the gardener, the vine, the branches, and the fruit. And we'll be looking at the Gospel of John, 15th chapter, verses 1 through 17. The gardener, the vine, the branches, and the fruit. Those of you with your Bibles that have Jesus' words in red, you see that all of today's text is in red. In fact, if you look, you'll see that almost all of the chapters of 14 through 17 are mostly in red. In Jesus' text today, he, uh, he and his disciples are having their last meal together in the upper room before they go out to the garden where he's going to be arrested. And time is short. He realizes time is short. There's much that they need to do. There's much that they need to know and understand if they're going to carry on the work that Jesus has for them to carry on. Uh, the work that he's been preparing them for. And so if you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, if you'll go with me to this passage, the Gospel of John, Chapter 15, verses 1 through 17. I'm going to read through this, and then I'm going to have some, some follow-up to give you on this. Beginning with the first verse. It says, I am the true vine. And this is Jesus speaking, remember. I am the true vine, and my Father, his Father would have been God, my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch, the branch at this point where the disciples Nowadays, we're the branch. Cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. And a little later on, I'll explain to you what the fruit is. He prunes them so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Then he says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Then verse 5, he says, I am the vine. This is Jesus again. I am the vine. And you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away, and it withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands, and I remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. In verse 13, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. That's what Jesus was getting ready to do for us. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. And then verse 17, he says, this is my command, love each other. Jesus so often spoke, not literally, but figuratively. He painted word pictures, in other words. 
And this morning, we're going to take a look at a sample of that. And in this one, he says, I am. I am. That's the I am sayings of Jesus. And they're powerful and they're strong and they're important. Jesus said, I am the true, what? Vine. I am the true vine. If we are to understand what Jesus was getting at here, we must look beyond the surface and do some exploring. It says we have to go beyond the actual words and dig out the meaning. When Jesus spoke about vineyards, the people of Judea knew what he was talking about. There was an industry that had been carefully cultivated throughout the country for centuries. It was crucial because it was a cash crop as opposed to grain, which was raised purely for consumption. In America, the essential crop was corn. I remember my history. But the cash crop, for us in the South anyway, was what? Tobacco and cotton. That was our cash crop. It was therefore vital to the economy of the land. And I don't really know much about vineyards. I know it has some it's true luck relatives down below Lake City that own one. People used to ask me all the time if we were related. We were, but I didn't know anything about the vineyards. But uh, from what I read, the particular branches that do not bear fruit are cut out to further conserve the energy of the plant. And if this constant cutting back was not done, the result would be a crop that was not up to its full potential. So when Jesus spoke about vineyards, certainly the people could identify with that metaphor, just as you and I can identify with conversations about uh, tobacco and cotton. Uh, at least our generation can. Some of the young ones now may not, but I was such an important part of our world. Uh, it didn't make any difference whether or not you were a farmer you know, we grew, we had grown up with it. But there is something else that we, these listeners would most certainly know about that we quite possibly wouldn't have known about. A vineyard was the symbol of, of the nation for them. Uh, and in America, we might think of the amber waves of grain, but in Judea, they thought of their nation, as they thought of it as a vineyard. It was a kind of national identity for them. And over and over again in the Old Testament, Israel is pictured as the vine or the vineyard of God. For example, Isaiah the prophet pictured Israel as the vineyard of God. He said, the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Jeremiah said, we read God referring to his chosen people in this way. I planted you as a choice vine. Hosea spoke a word of judgment when he said, Israel has become an empty vine. In the Psalms, we read that God compares Israel to a vine that came out of Egypt. And for those who like to combine some history with the Bible, and don't take that out of context, it does not replace the Bible, but a quote from Josephus, Josephus who was a Roman historian for that day, informs us that over the temple in Jerusalem was carved a gold leaf grapevine and it stood as a symbol of national unity. Israel itself was in the eyes of its people, the true vine, whose roots ran all the way back to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. So this was the history that they had. And Jesus' analogy here that I shared with you earlier, he compared himself to a vine while the fruit-bearing branches here are the disciple. God the farmer is depicted as the one who cultivates the vineyard. He waters and he tends it so that the vine is properly nourished. He takes pride in his crop, but this means that he also prunes the vines and removes the dead wood. The grapes hang on the branches. What Jesus is saying becomes pretty clear when you know the history. The disciples should receive their strength from Jesus because he is the true vine. That's the message he was trying to get across, part of the message. If they break away from him, they will be like unproductive branches 
and die and bear no fruit, they then will have to be pruned out. Now what can we make of this analogy that Jesus used in terms of our daily life? What's the message for us today? Well, does it, does it mean exactly to be God's vineyard? I want to share three points with you on this, and they aren't very long. The first one is this. I think that it raises a question that we must ask, ask, ask ourselves and answer. Are we bearing fruit for the kingdom of God? Are we bearing fruit for the kingdom of God? You need to be able to answer that. How can we tell? Well, how do we tell a pear tree? We, we, we tell it by the fruit that it bears. How do we tell an apple tree? We tell it by the fruit that it bears. How can you tell a Christian the same way by the fruit that we bear? The fruits of the vine are not church attendance. This is an important thought, but I think sometimes we get it wrong. The fruits of the vine are not your church attendance, or your biblical knowledge, or your individual stewardship. Now, those are important things. Don't go out and say the preacher said you didn't have to do those things anymore, because I didn't say that. But that's not what we're talking about today when we're talking about bearing fruit. Uh, the true fruit of the vine is loving and a compassionate life. It's a loving and compassionate life. That's what Jesus expects of us. It's what this message is about. It comes down to this. How do you treat people? How do you treat people on a day-to-day -day basis? That's as simple and as direct as I can make it. I read a story by another preacher. I, I didn't know him. I came across this, but... It was about a particular lady who was in his little country church in Tennessee many years ago. He said it was interesting to him that before he even met everyone in his church, they were telling him about this lady. They were saying that she is such a religious person. It's true that every time she came to church, she said she brought a Bible with her. Indeed, everywhere she would go all over town, she had that Bible with her. At the evening worship, they would frequently call on lay people to pray like we do here quite often. And she would always be the first person uh, on her feet to stand up and to pray. That was her thing. And her prayers were beautiful, very impressive. It seemed like the subject of religion was always on her mind. That's what she talked about. And she almost didn't know how to carry on a simple conversation that didn't involve religion. The problem, he said, that I had was that when it came to people who were down in society, the people who were poor, the unemployed, the alcoholics, people like we see on the streets out here all the time, the homeless, she was relentless in her criticism. He said she was without mercy and without compassion. So there was judgment and nothing else about her. So he said, after a while, despite all of these outward appearances of religion and despite everyone calling her this very, very special religious person, he said, I had to begin asking myself the question, does this individual really bear fruits of the Christian life? Does she really bear fruits of the Christian life? The issue is not to see how much knowledge we have or even necessarily how sincere you are. The issue is how do we treat each other? How do we treat people? You know, if you're in Christ, people will be able to see the fruits of your life in terms of your compassion and your love and your attitude. And that's what we've been talking about for some time in us. It's one thing to, to know the words in the scripture and be able to say the right things, but people are watching how we live in front of them, you know. And so it's, they're looking for the full package. And the most important part of that package, Jesus is saying in this scripture, is how we treat each other. And not just each other in the church, but each other in general. <clears throat> so the first point was, are you bearing fruit? Secondly, there's such a thing as unproduct an unproductive life. In Jesus' analogy here, the farmer, which is God, is depicted as pruning out the bad branches. 
You know, we don't like to wrestle with that concept because it implies that God cut some people out. There's an element of judgment in it that we would just as soon not deal with. There are those who are quick to point out that Jesus was here specifically referring to the Jews as if it only applied to the Jews back in that day. We know that's not true. We miss the point if we believe that. We don't understand that if we, uh, if we think that it doesn't include the Christians. The same thing includes the church today, especially the church today, because this is the world we live in. Dead branches are not only non-productive, they pull the energy away from the vine and keep it from fruit-bearing new branches. We like to think that there are various degrees of allegiance, but the truth is that in God's vineyard, and that's what we're talking about, God's vineyard, there are only two kinds of branches. Those that bring forth fruit and those that don't. The former are, are cultivated, the latter are pruned out. Well, we don't like things sometimes that, that cut dry, do we? We like a middle ground. We like gray areas in there. There's no gray area in Jesus' message today. We either are or we aren't. We either are or we aren't. And then the third point, and this one is very brief, is that we must cultivate a meaningful relationship with Jesus Christ. We must cultivate. That means it's action on our part. Don't just get back and just absorb it, you know. We need to work at having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, our part is in making the choice to accept him. That's not going to be forced on us. But we need to worship uh, and, and work on growing that relationship. Uh, Jesus said it this way, You must abide in me, and my words abide in you. So that's another question for us today is Jesus' words abiding in us. Is it a part of who we are? He's talking here about a relationship. As the fruit receives its nourishment from the vine, so too do we turn to Christ for our daily nourishment and our daily growth. How tragic it is that so many today see their strength as being financial security or maybe respect from their peers or a whole host of other things that we make important in the world that we live in today. But these things may feed us for a day or even for a season, but it can't be what it's all about. It can't be our priority because there comes a time when they will not bring the deep nourishment that we see. We know that, don't we? As I look across my congregation, every one of us knows what that is. Life's not always perfect, is it? Everything doesn't always go the way we want it to. There are disappointments, you know, in life. And uh, these material things that we accumulate that we make so important sometimes is not what it's all about. It's just the opposite of what Jesus is teaching here in this lesson today. What we need at the end of the day in our life is Jesus and that relationship with him. So as Jesus said, I am the true vine. As the Father has loved me, so I love you. And what happens when we abide in him and he abides in us? Then we can love each other the way he wants us to. And in doing that, if you read back over the scripture again that I shared with you earlier from John, we do that, then our joy will be made complete. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to have our usual altar call here in just a moment. I'm going to ask the band to go ahead and start playing. Again, if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, we really appreciate you tuning in. If you have a home, a church home of your own, you need to be in your church home. But if you don't have one, again, I invite you to come worship with us here at Quimby. At 11 o'clock on Sunday morning is the best Saturday at 9.30 out at Effingham. Either place where we make you welcome. But the most important thing is be in church. Have fellowship with other Christians. And get into the Word and grow as close to the Lord as you possibly can. And let's remember the things that are important and the things that He expects us to do. And the most important thing, if you listen to His teaching, uh, has to do with 
working with other people. And as Jesus said, just before we went back to be with his father, go out and make disciples for him. So we are supposed to be bearing fruit. Till next time, may God bless you.